Okay, you guys asked for it. I've been doing fire training this spring and so I thought I'd bring you along today and show you just what the fire crew does and why we do it. Are you ready for things to get hot? If you've heard me talk about my research before, then you might already have some idea of just how important controlled burns are to the prairie. They are able to eliminate invasive plant species that the managers don't want in the prairie and they also are important for the reproduction of some of the native prairie plants. Not to mention that a lot of the native prairie animals, including the American bison, actually prefer to forage in recently burned areas on the nice fresh new shoots of vegetation that pop up through the ashes. I do my field research at the Nechusa Grasslands, which is part of the Illinois Nature Conservancy, and this is also where I did my fire training and am participating in controlled burns of the prairie. Every burn in the prairie starts with a map, and this is the map of the site that we'd be burning today. We're just going to do the part of the map that I've outlined here, since the land managers don't want the entire unit to be burned. The winds are coming from the east in the direction of this arrow, which means that we need to start the burn on the exact opposite side of the site from the winds, that way the fire doesn't get out of control. As you watch the videos I'll take today, you'll see that a lot of what we do depends on the direction and speed of the wind and how that affects the fire's behavior. From the start point, which is directly opposite from the wind, we'll ignite, and then two teams will work in opposite directions to make a ring of burned ground around the edges of the site, and they'll meet back at the other side, where the wind will draw the head fire across the site and burn the interior. One team will move clockwise around the site, and the other team will move counterclockwise around the site. This is the team that will be moving clockwise around the site as we burn it today, and I'll be following them on the burn. While this is the team that will be moving counterclockwise, we won't see them until we've finished ringing the fire and have burned the head fire off. Once our teams have made it to the point of ignition, they'll clear a line so that the fire doesn't jump from the parts of the site that we do want to burn to the parts of the site we don't want to burn. In this shot you can see that the crew boss is using a chainsaw to clear away small sticks and things, while the three crew members in the front are using a variety of hand tools to clear away the extra vegetation, especially those tall dry grasses. Since the wind is coming from the east, we don't want the fire to jump across this line, so they're trying to remove as much vegetation as possible, even trying to scrape all the way down to the bare soil, because bare soil doesn't really burn. However, this is perhaps the most labor-intensive part of the entire burn job. Once the crews have decided that everything is good to go, we'll start the fire, and then the ignition person will walk along using a drip torch like you see here. The drip torch is filled with flammable fuel, and then there's a wick on the end that is lit with the fire, and then the person can walk along dripping lit fuel onto the ground, in this case onto the oak leaves in this little oak woodland that we're burning. The ignition person's job is to walk slowly and drip the fuel onto the burned area and to stop every once in a while to watch the fire behavior to make sure they're not going too fast or too slow and that all patches have been burned evenly so that the fire will progress nicely. It's important and interesting to take note of fire behavior here. See how the fire is burning in the oak leaves? This site contains both this oak woodland and some grassland areas, and the fire will behave very differently in these two different kinds of ground fuel. Remember that the wind behavior is super important to the behavior of a fire, and the wind can change as it moves over the hot ground. Do you see this little ash whirl or tornado? The smoke in a fire like this can get very thick very quickly, so it's important for everyone on the line to be using their eyes and ears all the time. Now that our crew has moved into the grassland area, it's time for a slightly different strategy. This time, a crew member at the beginning of the line will lay down what we call a wet line using a hose with water and some detergent to make sure that the water sticks to the vegetation in the ground. In this case, the mowed fire line could still burn because it's covered in grasses and it's difficult to get to the mineral soil, so the wet line will provide extra insurance to make sure that the fire does not jump outside of where we actually want the site to burn. 
The ignition person needs to relight their torch from the fire on the ground and then start walking to drip fuel on the grassland just like they did in the forest line. However, if you watch here, you'll see that the drip torch person needs to occasionally adopt different strategies for dispersing the fuel on different kinds of terrain and different ground fuel loads. Do you see the guy in the red helmet there? That's the burn boss. He's in charge of this entire operation, and his job is extremely important. At certain points, he may reevaluate how the fire is going along each of the lines and ask the line bosses and the ignition people to change their strategies. In this case, he's suggesting a different strategy for the way the ignition person disperses their fuel over the ground so that it's more effective in the short grasses before the fire reaches the tall grasses. The team of people following behind the ignition person are the suppression team, and they're perhaps the most important out of everyone working on the fire line. The suppression team can use hand tools and more hoses and water to suppress the flames on the outer edge of the burn line and make sure that the fire doesn't jump the line. The suppression team works slowly, often moving back and forth up and down the line to make sure all of the embers and flames on this outside edge of the burn line are out, and they also need to be looking across the line to make sure that no embers have jumped the line and started fires, what we call spot fires, on the other side of this path. As the creeping fire gets to these tall grasses, watch how its behavior changes, especially with a slight gusting of the wind. Tall dry grasses burn hot and fast. I took a stroll back through the woodland and into the grasslands that had already burned. You can see the fire has moved far into the interior of this site, and what's left closer to the line where we started is mostly just smoking ground and ash at this point. As we turn our gaze, though, you can see where the fire is still roaring through what looks like another bunch of very tall, dry grasses, and the smoke plume from them is... Wow, it's impressive. That is a lot of smoke. It can actually change the color of the sunlight hitting the ground when it gets in between the sun and where you're looking. And again, it's super important, even for an observer like me, to be watching not only the behavior of the live fire, but also to be walking up and down the line to look for fire that might creep through the grasses and through the wet line, and also to make sure that no embers have jumped the line in the air and have started spot fires on the other side of the line. Looks good so far! 
Ideally, the team working on a burn line works smoothly and quickly, but not in a rushed or panicked way. You can see how the ignition person is continually looking backwards to check on the behavior of the fire and the spacing of the team, while keeping an appropriate distance from the wet line person so that they can fully soak the ground to prevent any creepage of the fire. It's important that the line boss for this clockwise crew of the fire takes a moment every now and again to watch the progress of the fire from the counterclockwise crew. The crews need to be working at approximately the same pace in order to ring the fire. If they outpace one another, the fire could come roaring across the site, which could be dangerous for the slower crew. One of my favorite things about being on the burn line is that no two days are the same and no two sites are the same. We come across lots of hazards that require troubleshooting and quick thinking. In this case, we found a giant snag that totally would have caught on fire if we hadn't noticed it first. Luckily, it's near enough to the line that even though it's tall and could burn and either throw embers or fall across the line, if we wet it appropriately with the hoses, that should protect it from lighting on fire. The ignition person will also then walk a ring of fire out around the snag rather than allowing the snag to burn, and hopefully this tree will still be standing when we're done. We're finally at the eastern edge of the site, and that means that the fire will be now be moving with the wind. Watch how its behavior changes with those gusts of easterly wind pushing it, and how the two fires of the edges meet at this corner. The ignition person doesn't need to wait for a wet line team anymore because the easterly wind will keep the fire inside the site, so she can walk as fast as she wants and the head fire will just take off across the site. See how quickly it's moving? I can't even see the head fire anymore behind all of the smoke, but there it is, just pushing across the prairie and into the interior of the site. I also really like the way the ground looks after a head fire has just raced across it. It makes me think of an alien landscape, all black and charred with just these tiny little puffs of smoke emanating from embers on the ground. The site immediately after a fire is really, really interesting, and I definitely recommend checking it out and being on a burn crew if you have the opportunity. The way I achieved this opportunity is by taking the S-130 and S-190 wildland firefighter trainings and then doing an actual live training day at the Nechusa Grasslands, which is administered by the Illinois Nature Conservancy. You have to do all of those trainings at the very least in order to become a wildland firefighter and be allowed to participate in controlled burns like this. Once the fire has been run, it's extremely important that the teams get together and talk about what happened to evaluate their practices and continue to improve. There are often trainees on the line like myself, and so it's a good opportunity for them to learn about what went wrong and what to do better next time. I need to thank Bill Kleiman, the Nechusa Grasslands, and the Illinois Nature Conservancy, as well as the rest of the Nechusa burn crew for allowing me to learn how to do prescribed burns and to participate in prescribed fire here at Nechusa. It's been a wonderful experience and I really encourage the rest of you who might be curious about what it's like to do prescribed burns to check it out and maybe take the training for yourselves because I think it's really interesting and a good way to get active in conservation and restoration work in the early spring. If you like this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and read more science on my blog. You can also find me occasionally on the radio show Blue Dot, and every other Monday on Dungeon Dwellers on Twitch. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.